Thank you for joining us for this interactive Facebook Live event presented by Seitman Cancer Center based at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Seitman is an international leader in cancer treatment, research, prevention, and education. Ranked among the top cancer centers by U.S. News and World Report, Seitman also is one of only a few U.S. cancer centers to receive the highest rating of exceptional from the National Cancer Institute. Welcome to today's Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us for this interactive Facebook Live event presented by Seitman Cancer Center, which is based at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Uh, today we're discussing cancer genetics and inherited cancer risk, including ways that we can reduce that risk. And joining us are three Washington University experts who uh, treat patients at Seitman Cancer Center or through Seitman Kids at St. Louis Children's Hospital. And I want to welcome each of you and, and of course, uh, introduce you as well. Uh, my first uh, expert on, on my right is uh, Dr. Patricia Dixon, who is a geneticist as well as chief of the Division of Genetics and Genomic Medicine and the Centennial Professor and Chief of the Division of Pediatrics and Genetics. So thank you, Dr. Dixon, for being here. Thank you so much. And then uh, to her right is uh, Dr. Paul Weiss, who is a, a colorectal surgeon and professor of surgery, uh, as well as a director of the Washington University Inherited Colorectal Cancer and Polyposis uh, Registry. So thank you for being here also, Dr. Weiss. Thanks for having me. And finally, we have Dr. Amy Sear, who is a, uh, is a uh, specialist in hereditary breast cancer and cancer risk, as well as breast imaging and health. And she's also an assistant professor of medicine here at Washington University. Thank you, Dr. Sear, uh, for being here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that um, we have do some questions for our three experts here, but we also welcome your input as well. So if you have any questions uh, that arise during the uh, program, Please put them in the uh, comment section uh, for our three experts uh, to answer here uh, momentarily. So uh, first of all, Dr. Dixon, as, as a geneticist, we kind of wanted to uh, start with you. Um, could you tell us um, what percentages of cancers are hereditary uh, as opposed to, to non-hereditary uh, uh, cancers? Um, you know, the ones that run in the family, what percentage do they make up? So hereditary cancers are actually a relatively small percentage of cancers. Only about 5 to 10 percent of all cancers are hereditary. Okay, very good. So a small amount, but, but certainly a, 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 a sizable portion of the population who should, who should be interested in, in this topic today. Um, so I'm wondering, um, uh, are there any differences? Be I mean, obviously, hereditary cancers are, are passed from one generation to another, but are there other differences between hereditary and non-hereditary cancers? Sure. Let me first give you a little background on the link between cancer and DNA. So all the cells in our body have to divide and proliferate or make more copies of themselves. Um, at certain times. So that process turns on at a certain time, turns off at a certain time. But if that cell division process goes haywire, then that can cause a cancer. Now the reason that that process might go awry is if there's been a change in the DNA. So for example, if a DNA strand breaks, which happens all the time, the DNA strand breaks, but then it fixes itself in the wrong way, then that can turn on that division process abnormally. And that only happens within the cell. Now, the body also has processes that tamp down cancer from happening or stop it from happening. So for example, some genes, their job is to repair DNA strand breaks so that they don't cause an abnormal repair. Um, so those DNA repair genes, if there's a flaw in them, then cancers have a higher chance of happening because they can escape that that DNA fixing mechanism. It's kind of like if you imagine that your body has a security system, right? Mm -hmm. An anti-cancer security system. But then some people have a mistake in their security system, so it's only watching half the house. So then that cancer can really escape that security system and you have a higher risk. So cancer is cancer, but in hereditary cancer, um, there's a different mechanism for why that cancer might happen. And we also find that there are certain cancers that are more likely to be hereditary and others that aren't. So there's a long list of these, but for example, cervical cancer is almost never hereditary, but then other types of cancers like breast and ovarian and colon that we'll hear about later are, 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 can be hereditary, but still most of them aren't. 
Very good. That was a great analogy, by the way. That, that helps me understand um, a lot more. Now, obviously, there are certain things and activities that we encourage people to, un to undertake to prevent you know, non-hereditary cancers, exercising, eating right, not smoking. Um, are those healthy activities also, do they also lend well to, to hereditary cancers and, and reducing their risk? I mean, those things are good to do regardless. Um, but even if you lived pristinely, you can't completely prevent cancer from happening. We think that because the hereditary cancers are caused by a faulty gene in the body, that those types of prevention mechanisms work a little bit less well in people who have these sorts of cancer uh, genes. Okay, thank you. Well, is there anything that you can do if you do have the risk of hereditary cancer to kind of reduce that risk? There is. If you have a personal history of cancer, um, particularly under the age of 50, if you have a family history of cancer, particularly if those people are under the age of 50 or have multiple cancers, um, then get uh, genetic counseling and or testing for that. That's the most important thing you can do to try to see whether you have a gene that causes hereditary cancer. Remember, these genetic tests don't test for cancer. They're testing for these genes that cause a higher risk of cancer. And these genes are passed down in families um, in what we call a autosomal dominant fashion, which means that with each generation there's a 50-50 chance of passing down this gene. And for some of these genes, the recommendations are for specific types of prophylactic surgery that you can do to reduce your risk. Other times it's just certain types of surveillance to catch that cancer early. But that's the most important thing you can do to protect yourself and your loved ones. And a genetic counselor kind of well, can walk a family or an individual through the risks and the potential um, uh, actions that they can take in, in regard to that. Yes, yeah, so a genetic counselor is a specifically trained uh, individual. So I'm, I'm a geneticist, not a genetic counselor. A genetic counselor has a master's degree in genetic counseling and they will obtain a family history looking at all the family members mapping out the risk of um, whether there is a potential cancer gene in the family, uh, per determine what that proper test would be. And then after the test results, um, go through that with you, make sure that you understand it, and make sure that anyone who is in your family is at risk and wants testing can then be referred to the proper place for that. And I know Seidman and WashU offer that service as well, and, and there is a number on our screen for viewers who, who might be interested in pursuing that. Thank you for that explanation. Now, I wanted to turn to uh, Dr. Weiss, who is an expert in uh, inherited colon cancer risk, um, also a colorectal cancer surgeon. Um, Dr. Weiss, there are a number of colorectal conditions that are inherited. Could you give us an overview of what they are? Yeah, the, the ones that we think of the most commonly are colorectal cancer. So as <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Dixon, so well pointed out, um, oftentimes we'll have family members that have other family members that uh, have a history of colorectal cancer. And so we think about that uh, as increasing someone's risk of, of developing colorectal cancer themselves. Um, there are certain inherited colorectal cancer syndromes that put people at substantially increased risk of developing colorectal cancer. Those are luckily relatively rare. Uh, they probably account for no more than about 5% of all the colorectal cancers that we see. Uh, many of those conditions uh, are ones that are represented by developing multiple polyps. So we kind of divide the inherited syndromes for colorectal cancer into uh, those that develop multiple polyps. And those put <clears throat> excuse me, folks at increased risk of developing cancer. Uh, and then there are some syndromes where folks will develop a polyp and that polyp will turn into a cancer so rapidly that we may not even actually see the polyp develop at the time. So uh, different different groupings of those syndromes. There are some other uh, rare um, conditions that we'll also see that can be inherited. Uh, one that's not as rare is, um, is inflammatory bowel disease. So Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, can sometimes be associated or run in families, and there are probably, um, there are probably genetic uh, associations with those conditions. Thank you for that explanation. I know that colon cancer is often called one of the most preventable types of cancer, and, and, and could you tell us what that means and what people need to be aware of in regards to that? Yeah, so um, the vast majority of colorectal cancers uh, develop initially as a polyp, so a benign condition. Uh, it's considered precancerous, and then eventually over time, and it's a very slow process in most patients, will develop into a cancer. 
And so uh, similar to what Dr. Dixon was mentioning, that process of the DNA and how those things happen within the cells, <clears throat> that condition within the colon is a very slow process. When we do colorectal cancer screening, the gold standard is considered colonoscopy. And when we do a colonoscopy, oftentimes we can identify those polyps and remove them before they ever have a chance to turn into a cancer. So colorectal cancer screening is one of the few screening modalities out there that actually can prevent the cancer from happening in the first place. Many of the other screenings that we do for, say, for prostate cancer, breast cancer, things like that, uh, are usually trying to identify the cancer early and uh, catch it early, and so it can be treatable at an early stage, uh, whereas uh, many of our colorectal cancer screening modalities are actually catching it before it ever has a chance to turn into a cancer. So obviously something you want to stay on top of. 100%. Is, are, there, are there screening recommendations different for inherited cancers or versus non-hereditary uh, cancers? They are in general, yes. Uh, so whenever you have a, a patient who's considered at moderate or normal risk, uh, that's someone who does not have a significant family history of colorectal cancer or polyps, uh, and also other conditions that can be associated with uh, higher risk of developing colorectal cancer. I mentioned earlier inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Those can be associated, for example, with an increased risk of colorectal cancer. So for folks who don't have those increased risks, uh, the recommend, standard recommendation now is it used to be age 50, uh, but that's actually moved up now very recently to age 45. So the recommendation for the majority of the population is to get their initial colorectal cancer screening, whether that's colonoscopy or getting the stool tested for cancer DNA uh, or other stool tests to look for blood, um, those can be done through someone's primary care provider. Uh, but those are all recommended to start now at age 45. But as you asked, uh, those who have a known family history that's strong or those who have a known inherited colorectal cancer syndrome, those recommendations are to start much earlier for many of those patients. So some of them, so I mentioned uh, conditions where patients have multiple polyps across their colon. Uh, some of those screening recommendations may start in, even in the early teens uh, for children that may be at risk uh, for developing that. Uh, but most of the time it's, uh, it's at least 10 years before the youngest family member in the family got colorectal cancer who had that syndrome. Now you mentioned colonoscopy is kind of the gold standard, the, the best of the available tests, but I also, I imagine that any test is better than no test. What, what sort of advice do you offer people regarding the type of, of test that they take? Yeah, it's important for uh, everyone to talk to their primary care providers, whether that's a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or uh, physician, uh, to find out which test is best for them. Uh, some of it may depend on insurance or uh, other opportunities, uh, financial or otherwise. Accessibility, not everyone has access to getting a colonoscopy easily. Uh, so it, it may vary uh, from patient to patient, uh, but there are some where um, patients just have their stool tested uh, to see if they're at high risk. There are other tests that involve certain types of x-ray tests. Uh, sigmoidoscopy is another type of test where they just test the left side of the colon, um, but colonoscopy is, is definitely considered the gold standard, and we recommend that for the majority of patients, especially if you have a known family history, even if it's not a syndrome, uh, the recommendation is for a colonoscopy. Very good. Thank you for that information. You're welcome. And we also wanted to uh, w uh, welcome Dr. Sear again, who, has, as we mentioned before, is a breast health specialist. Uh, Dr. Sear, as you know, you know, breast cancers like colon cancers and other types can be passed from, uh, from parents to children. And I'm wondering if you could uh, get, kind of give us an overview of, of what that looks like. Um, how do you know if, if it's a hereditary breast cancer? How does that change uh, the circumstances of, of a person's, of a family situation? Sure. Well, as Dr. Dixon said, about 5 to 10 percent of cancers, including breast cancers, are due to these genes that we can identify with tests. About 60 to 70 percent of breast cancers are just what we consider sporadic. They just happen. Combinations of lifestyle, environment, bad luck, little genetic things we're still figuring out. So the vast majority of women who develop breast cancer don't have a family history, which is why it's so important that every woman starts screening at age 40. So we recommend mammography yearly starting at age 40. Um, then there are women who have a family history, but they may not have one of these identifiable genes. There's probably something going on in the family that puts them at a higher risk, even again, if we can't catch it on a, on a genetic test. So we have calculators or we can put in information about the family history, information about that individual patient to get a sense of where her risk is compared to average. And a lot of those women will be eligible for more intensive screening or more frequent screening, different screening modalities, that type of thing. 
Now, I, kn I know we've worked with patients before who um, received an inherited breast cancer, uh, you know, advanced risk of inherited breast cancer, and, and they're men, right? They're male family members of someone who might have passed that mutation on to them. Is that commonly known, or, or what should people know about that? That's a great question. It's not I think well enough known, but for all of these cancer genes, no matter whether you know whether the cancer risk is male cancer or female cancer or you know doesn't you know uh, sex doesn't matter, men pass these genes on and you know can certainly have these genes and be carriers of these genes just as much as women. So um, you know certainly we pay attention to the men in the family, um, and we would recommend testing for men if we know that there's a, a gene in the family that can be passed on, but specifically with the BRCA2 gene, there is definitely an elevated male breast cancer risk. That risk is still overall lower than the risk for an average woman, but it's about a 7 to 8 percent lifetime risk. And so some men who have these genes are actually eligible for screening themselves. And the genetics counseling that Dr. Dixon mentioned earlier is something that would walk a family through this and help determine the risk of every individual within the family, whether no matter their gender. Is that is that how that works? Exactly. And then, yeah, again, depending on what the finding is, you can get a better sense of, yeah, which family members have what level of risk. And then we can really personalize screening depending on the family history or the specific gene. I'm kind of fascinated by genetics counseling. I mean, it's not that new, but there aren't that many places that kind of offer the, the robust offerings that, that Siteman and Wash U do. Um, and they, I've seen where they'll walk an entire family through the process. And it isn't like it doesn't direct people about the sort of treatment they should have, but it does present them the options that they can either uh, pursue now or even later in life. Is there is there anything that you think people should know about genetic counseling if, if they don't know what it is or maybe they're even afraid of it? Sure. I actually do see people who are afraid of having genetic testing because they are. They're afraid they're going to be told that they need to do something that they may not want to do or be ready for. So I think that's a really important point is that there are options for people um, and ultimately the decision about which option is the best for them is that that decision is in their hands. We provide the information so they can make an educated choice. But even women with BRCA genes, those women may have a very high lifetime risk of breast cancer. It could be 70-ish percent. Some women will opt for a double mastectomy to reduce their cancer risk, but many women don't, and that's okay. So for those women, we offer more intensive screening, and some women are even eligible for risk-reducing medications. Um, so it doesn't have to be something as drastic as surgery, but again, I'm not here to tell someone what she needs to do. I'm here to tell her what her options are. That's right. Always good to know your options, even if now is not the time to act. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And Dr. Dixon, we sort of delved into this a little bit already, but, you know, different types of cancer can be related through like a BRCA uh, mutation, correct? So it might, in, in, it might manifest as one type of cancer in one member of a family, but in another family it might show up as a, as a type of cancer elsewhere in the body. Could you kind of explain what that is and, and what that means? Yeah, I think there's there is a little bit of a misconception because the gene is called BRCA that it's specific to the breast, but in reality it's one of those genes that repairs our DNA when it breaks. And it does that in any in throughout the body. So different types of cancers that people can be at risk for with BRCA gene um, malfunctions can include breast, ovarian, prostate, <clears throat> excuse me, and even pancreatic cancer. And um, we don't exactly understand why those specific cancers are um, increased in people with BRCA uh, mistakes. And, um, but we do know that these genes cause an increased risk of cancer and um, not cause the cancer themselves. And that's part of why these genes can uh, manifest differently in different people in the family. And so I guess, you know, Thanksgiving and the holidays are coming up, and, and I always think that that's probably a good time. No one really wants to talk about, you know, family members who have had cancer in the past, but I assume that it's probably a pretty valuable time to get together and have that conversation to see if any of those patterns might be present. I, I think any time is a good time to talk about genetics in the family, um, but, uh, but absolutely, whatever opportunities you have to talk about it, remember that um, as Dr. Sears said, this information is being provided. It doesn't force you or compel you or even pressure you to make any specific decisions. Um, and that this is uh, something that you are doing for your loved ones, for, uh, for your children, in order to have them best have that information so they can protect themselves if they so choose. 
Now, I think an important question, I mean, every parent cares about the well-being of their child, and that can show up in a number of ways. What do parents who know that they have an inherited cancer risk, what can they do for their children? Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you know you have an inherited cancer risk um, and you get the, the genetic testing for it, um, that is uh, the most valuable thing you can do for your children because then they can get the testing themselves to find out whether they carry that gene and what their risk is and make those informed decisions. Now in terms of the age of the child, for cancers that are um, have their onset in adulthood, we typically wait until the child is old enough to consent for themselves on whether they want to have that information. Um, there are a few cancers that can happen earlier and before um, that age of consent, and in that case we would offer the testing for cancer um, genes in the children, even if they're minor children. Um, those tend to be more rare, um, but that is the most important thing that, um, that you can do for your children. Very good. And again, you know, the holidays are coming up, and th that might be a time to start thinking about the topic. Uh, I've run out of questions, but we do have some viewer questions here. Um, and this one here is from Mel. And Mel asks, uh, is asking about hereditary lung cancer. What are the tests needed? Um, and are family hereditary links multi generational? Yeah, it's a great question. A specific types of lung cancer, um, it's not one of the more common types of hereditary cancer that we see. Uh, specific types uh, of cancer could potentially be hereditary. I think it would be important um, for someone to go through what those cancers are, when they onset, whether the person, whether the person in the family who had the lung cancer had other risk factors that, such as smoking. Um, and typically, though, all of the hereditary testing, in other words, the testing for genes that cause cancer, there's typically a panel of genes that is the same for whatever type of gene of cancer they're looking at. Uh, we, we used to do more targeted testing, and in some cases we will, looking for genes that specifically cause breast cancer or genes that specifically cause colon cancer. But more and more we're doing a panel of genes that cause hereditary cancer. So it may not be as critical to figure out what gene it is you think you might be at risk for, um, but just to, to see. I have a lot of people in the family with a lot of the same kind of cancer. That's a little suspicious. Or many people in the family with cancer, and they seem really young, and, and that seems suspicious. And then just just get to, you know, just see a genetic counselor if you can, um, get tested. There even are some direct-to-consumer options if you really cannot get um, access to these. Very good. Thank you. We actually we have a question here from Sheila who's asking about this, and she says that she's wondering about the BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation because her mother had breast cancer, and Sheila's wondering if she should have some sort of test done to determine if she herself has that same mutation. Um, so your, her mother has the BRCA1? Uh, I, that's unknown from the question, only that her mother did have breast cancer. Okay. So with a family member who's had breast cancer, um, it's important to know the age of onset. I don't know if you want to answer this, Dr. Sierra. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, first, I think it's a matter of determining how likely is it that the mom had a BRCA gene. Again, only 5 to 10 percent of breast cancers are due to those genes or some of the other breast cancer genes. So if mom is still alive and, and, and interested in getting genetic testing, that's the best place to start because then we can get a better sense of why mom got breast cancer. If mom has one of those cancer genes, then the daughter has a 50% chance also, and we would definitely recommend testing. Unfortunately, sometimes the family members who had cancer have passed away, they're not here, or people don't have close relationships. In that case, we get more details about mom's breast cancer, how old she was, what type it was, to see if the daughter is eligible for testing. But even if she's not eligible for testing the daughter, she's probably at a higher than average risk for breast cancer because she had a mom with breast cancer. So someone like her, um, you know, might be eligible for additional screening um, beyond just yearly mammograms. We have a, it's kind of a follow-up question from a different viewer who's asking at what age would the daughter of positive parents uh, get screened for the first time or go through genetic counseling maybe for the first time? Time. I think this depends a little on the gene and what cancer you're talking about. Um, for, say, there's a known BRCA gene in the family, typically we recommend that, f that the women in the family be tested by age 25 because that's typically when we're going to start screening for women who carry a BRCA gene. Um, we start yearly MRIs at 25 and then start yearly mammograms in addition at age 30. 
but some of the cancer genes and some folks who have non-gene related family histories of cancer, the age at which to start depends on that history. But certainly for mammograms, age 40 is when we recommend starting. And we actually recommend, and several professional societies now recommend that um, anybody who is assigned female at birth have a risk assessment for breast cancer risk by age 30, specifically to try to identify the women who might be eligible for earlier onset screening or genetic testing, so we're not waiting too long. Very good, and I want to return to Dr. Weiss. I mean, a lot of this is, is you know, genetic counseling oftentimes involves breast cancer. Can it also involve colorectal cancer? And, and what should parents, you know, who may have passed a, a mutation onto their children know about their, their children's future health? Yeah, absolutely. So we, I frequently have my patients seeing the genetic counselors and seeing uh, Dr. Dixon to try to help sort out whether or not they may themselves. If, if there are a number of, as she mentioned, a number of uh, other cancers in the family and something seems a little bit fishy or a number of cancers where the patients in the family are younger. Um, so uh, things like uterine cancer, uh, there are other uh, types of ovarian cancer that can be associated with one particular condition called Lynch syndrome. So it can put uh, patients at uh, parents of increased risk for that. Um, so I, I think there's a multitude of questions kind of within that. Uh, one is uh, similar to what Dr. Sears said, is if, if you've got a family history, so, so let's say a parent had colorectal cancer, if they were at an older age, it probably is not substantially increasing your risk, but it may be, so it's important to consider getting testing at a younger age. So the standard recommendation instead of, as I said before, what used to be age 50 and now age 45, the recommendation is to get the initial screening at age 40, even if your parent uh, or loved one was, was uh, uh, older at the time of their diagnosis. But certainly the more cancers that are showing up within the family, the bigger the concern about a potential for an actual hereditary syndrome, those folks we would recommend potentially getting screened even earlier, so maybe even in their 20s. So a little bit similar to some of the breast cancer risk. But taking advantage of the uh, genetic counselors and their expertise in this realm is really critical. And a lot of folks, as was mentioned, are, are nervous or worried about doing that, and it's totally understandable. Um, uh, sometimes it's easier to kind of put your head in the sand and, and just hope for the best. But I think knowledge is power, and so the more that you can learn about the potential risk, the more you can do. I think the Simon Cancer website actually has a really nice um, risk calculator that can help people determine their potential likelihood of, uh, of getting a cancer and what age they should consider start screening. Uh, it can kind of give them an indicator of what they should probably talk, be talking to their primary care providers about. Uh, there's also some great work that our public health group have done to try to help uh, take all of the information from all the studies that have been done out there and to bring all that information together to help folks understand what they can do to help prevent cancers, both whether they have an inherited risk or not. Uh, you had asked that question earlier and I talked to my patients who have known hereditary syndromes, meaning they're at a substantially increased risk of developing cancer. There have been good studies showing that if those patients have healthy lifestyles, even in the setting of having a known gene mutation that puts them at increased risk, they still have a decreased risk of developing cancer in that setting. And as Dr. Sear mentioned, there are medications that they can sometimes give patients to help decrease the risk of breast cancer, even if they have a known, say, BRCA mutation. Even in the setting of, say, for example, Lynch syndrome, there are medications that we can give those patients to also decrease their risk. So we can't eliminate it completely, but we can decrease those risks. And thank you for mentioning your disease risk. And for our viewers out there, the, the uh, web address is yourdiseaserisk.com. And I think that's a great place to start. Um, it assesses a person's risk and even offers personalized tips on, on how to reduce that risk. Mm -hmm. But it certainly will help. I mean, there, you know, there's a lot of information here and a lot of, 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 of facts and even, you know, minutia. But I think it's important to get people started thinking about this. Um, maybe start searching out expertise and tools such as yourdiseaserisk.com, maybe even speaking with their primary care physician uh, about any concerns that they might have or patterns that they might have noticed in their family. And then it, you sort of take it one step at a time. It, it isn't everything has to be done now. It's a gradual learning process. And then figuring out what your options might be. Is that, would that be a good way to put it? Yeah, I think so. And I, I agree. I mean, the irony that we're talking about this while we're on an online uh, platform, but uh, certainly we all know that uh, the internet is, is, is rife with uh, information, both good and bad. And so I think trying to go to a trusted source where the information has been well-researched, uh, well-studied, and, and you've got experts who are trying to filter out uh, all that uh, bad stuff to try to get down and distill it down to the good stuff so that uh, patients can really, uh, really really have the information that they need is incredibly important. 
Well, we have Donna here who does have a question for you, Dr. Weiss. Um, uh, she says that if a person has hundreds of polyps, uh, how do you know if by biopsying one of them that the others aren't cancerous? Yeah, so that's actually a very difficult circumstance. So um, whenever we're taking care of patients who have multiple polyps or what we call polyposis, uh, we, we do the best we can to biopsy the ones that look the most concerning. Say, for example, when we're doing a colonoscopy and someone's known to have uh, hundreds or even thousands of polyps, um, we'll try to biopsy the ones that are the largest because those are the ones that are most likely to harbor a cancer within them um, or if they have concerning features when we look at them. So there are certain features that we can see with our eyes through the scope that make us concerned that it may have a cancer. But sometimes it becomes so difficult to be able to sort out those uh, through all those polyps and to control them with doing colonoscopies and trying to snip out the bigger polyps that we are worried have the highest risk to turn into a cancer. That's when we have to start thinking about surgery. And so uh, that's when, you know, when I come in and I'm working with the patients to decide uh, what type of operation do they need? When do they need it? Uh, are there ways that we can avoid the operation? So I have a number of these patients with polyps polyposis that we're tracking them very closely and keeping a close eye on their colon because obviously most folks would like to keep their colon if they can. Uh, and so, um, so we try to do everything we can to help them avoid having to have surgery. But at some point when the risks uh, outweigh the benefits of keeping the colon in place and we're worried that that ticking time bomb, that the timer is getting very close to zero and, and that cancer is about to develop, ultimately we have to prevent the cancer from forming or catch it as early as possible. That's when we start talking about an operation. I guess what seems reassuring to me is that Simon and Wash, you have, you know, different kinds of experts. So they might be coming here for a specific reason, but then behind the one person they may see most often, there's an entire team of specialists who are kind of looking at different aspects of that, of that patient's care, from geneticists to counselors to surgeons to, you know, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, et cetera. And, and the other thing that I, I really note about this um, subject in particular is that you it isn't, there isn't a, a hurry up, we got to make a decision now, a uh, decision all the time, right? Like very often people have time to confer with others, to speak with their family members, to speak with an expert and really kind of determine what the, what the best course of action might be for them or their family. And I assume that there's some sense of comfort that are given to uh, patients when, when they understand that kind of the breadth and the depth of the expertise um, available at, at an academic center, medical center like, like Siteman and Wash U. Yeah, the cool thing is, is we all work together, yeah. uh, and so this isn't the first time we've uh, <laughs> we've spoken together. And we actually try to meet on a monthly basis and talk about patients who have complex genetic circumstances or are at high risk for that. And so uh, we truly have a multidisciplinary approach to that to help. Because I recognize Dr. Dixon's got a lot of expertise in areas I know very little about, and the same with Dr. Sear. And so to, for us to be able to work together, I think we can really benefit patients tremendously. That's good to hear. We do have one more question from a viewer named Christy, and she's wondering about uh, prostate cancer and, and what, recommend, what recommendations there are for that. Dr. Dixon, would you like to? Yeah, uh, prostate cancer is one of the cancer types that can be hereditary. Again, most are not. Um, so it would fall under the same uh, types of um, guidelines if there's young people under the age of 50, if there's multiple family members, if you yourself have it. Um, then you, would, you should speak to your uh, doctor, try to find out family members who have cancer, um, and see if you can get counseling to see whether you are an, at risk enough to merit testing. Very good. Thank you. Well, we've run out of questions. I want to thank each of you for being here and sharing your, your knowledge with the, with the uh, audience. Uh, I also want to thank our audience for being here and to direct you to that website, yourdiseaserisk.com, that will help you determine uh, what your risk for very specific types of cancer are, and it will offer uh, recommendations for how you might reduce that risk. Uh, we also encourage you to continue following us on Facebook, uh, where future uh, notices of Facebook Live events will, will be posted. Thanks again for being here, uh, doctors, and, and thank you to our audience. Have a good day. Thank you.